Good morning YouTube, Warbles on a lot here, 24th of September, just getting ready for Fawzia Ibrahim and the round table discussion. If it is everywhere in the headlines, the news, the political statements, the sobering reality of rising household bills, it's everywhere. And every day there seems to be yet another development or political tussle over the so-called energy crisis facing Australia. Well, with so much talk and debate over the issue, you would think that some sort of solution would have emerged by now, but it hasn't. In fact, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce has warned that unless coal-fired generators keep their stations operating, it'll be lights out by January. And with another scorching summer around the corner, South Australia is scrambling to avoid a repeat of last year's blackout. But searching for one or multiple solutions would require a rethink of our energy consumption and production. We'd love to hear your views here at the Sunday Roundtable. Please do text us text us on 0418-226-576. You can also tweet us at RN Sunday Extra. To join the discussion with my guests this morning at the Sunday Roundtable, Tony Wood, the director of the Grattan Institute's Energy Program, Saul Kavanick, an analyst with the global company Woods McKenzie, and Rosemary Sinclair is the CEO of Energy Consumers Australia. Tony, Saul and Rosemary, welcome to the Sunday Roundtable. Good morning. Good morning, Fazio. Good morning. Now, Tony, if I could start with you. There is so much talk about this energy crisis that's gripping the eastern states. Sometimes I find it difficult to sift the information from the political volley. Is there a real crisis here, or is it scaremongering for political capital? I think, unfortunately, there's a fair bit of the latter involved in this, but of course, that's not because there are some significant problems, and uh, they've taken quite a lot, a long time to emerge, probably the last 10 or 15 years. The, the, the things that have contributed to the challenge we have today uh, have built up over that time, and unraveling that and scrambling that in a way that goes back sense is very challenging and politically sensitive, because energy has been a political animal in Australia for many, many decades, so it's not just about economics and physics, it's also about politics, and that's why life's complicated, but the core of it, the core of it is that electricity prices have been going up in some cases very significantly, putting real pressure on households and businesses. The security of the system has been questioned because of, for example, blackouts and major tension over last summer. And of course, the other key issue is that the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with our energy have not been going down in the way we need to if we, if we can contribute to climate change mitigation. So all three are a significant challenge, and that's why they get called a crisis. So many elements. Saul, do you agree that it's these three main elements that's brought us to the situation that we're here today? Well, I think, as uh, Tony mentions, this is quite a complicated problem, and uh, the complication is increased because it's become such a politically charged environment where there's a lot of different uh, groups politically and uh, on, the, on the industry side who are uh, using this crisis uh, to highlight uh, particular agendas or hobby horse issues, whether it's pro-coal, anti-coal, pro-renewables, anti-renewables. And the reality is it's a number of contributing factors which are all really come to the fore at this time. Mm -hmm. And this crisis has been built up uh, predominantly through policy failure, which is bipartisan across both sides of governments, across federal and state levels, going back over a decade, but it's only really, you know, uh, coming to the crunch yeah. now. And one subset of that is obviously the gas side of things, but then there's the broader side of things in terms of renewables penetration into the grid, the disruption we're seeing into what's a very traditional power system model, and the ability for our regulators to actually catch up and get ahead of the curve here, which they haven't been able to do to date. Now, Rosemary, what are you hearing from the consumer sector on this very protracted and, and, and convoluted, convoluted, convoluted debate over energy? Uh, look, the two most important things, Fazia, that we're hearing from consumers um, is that they, they don't see value um, coming from this market. Um, so that's the way they talk about the, um, the price uh, rises mm -hmm. from networks and wholesale and green schemes and retail that Rod Sims outlined so carefully. Um, in his National Press Club speech. Uh, but even more worrying than that, the second um, thing that uh, concerns me greatly is that consumers are saying that they don't have confidence that this market has their interests at heart. So we have a very important challenge to rebalance um, po 
policy and profit with purpose. And that's the way households and businesses look at energy. It's an essential service for the household. It's an essential service for business competitiveness. Well, let's, okay, so let's stay with the consumer for now and, and talk about how this is really hitting our pockets. The Australian uh, Competition and Consumer Commission has been conducting an inquiry into the competitiveness of retail electricity prices. This is the ACCC's chairman, Rod Sims. Uh, Rosemary, you, you were mentioning this a little earlier. This is him speaking at the National Press Club in Canberra on Wednesday. Our retail electricity pricing inquiry team heard stories of Australians having to ration electricity through winter, having to choose between paying medical bills and paying electricity bills, and having only a small amount to spend on food after meeting electricity bills and rent. It's a dire situation when a family has to decide on whether to pay medical bills or ensure their lights are kept on. Tony, the would you agree with Rosemary that the market doesn't have the consumer's interest at heart? I think um, each part of the market structure, the generators, the distribution companies, the retailers, and even the regulators would all say, of course they've got the consumer at heart. The evidence, of course, is that the results, as Rod's outlined and other people have commented on over the last several years now, would seem to be inconsistent with that. The results that we get, we're seeing now are having a very negative impact. Now, for most the vast majority of Australians, particularly households, electricity is still a relatively low part of their overall cost. But for many people who are on low incomes, people who are in, in situations where they would class, be classified as vulnerable to financial shocks, and for many businesses who are seeing very large price increases, um, they're not seeing the, the, the benefit. And they either blame the market, or they blame politicians, or they blame both, but they uh, They've certainly got some substantial reasons to be very unhappy that our electricity has gone from being amongst the cheapest in the world to amongst the most expensive. So, in your opinion, is the hype justified? I think the hype, the hype is justified because uh, of the large price increases. I think the, um, the, the questions of security of supply have been a little overdone, but we are not in a situation as we were a few years ago where we had very significant surplus capacity to get us through peak periods of high summer demand. Um, we've seen some large coal fire st power stations shutting down mm -hmm. and they haven't been replaced with uh, the equivalent sort of energy. And so, you know, that's why people get concerned. And, you know, people will say, well, the blackout in South Australia was caused by a storm, it wasn't caused by renewables and so forth. But a number of factors, again, contributed to that particular blackout. And as a result of that, people are not, certainly not prepared to put up with that sort of situation in the 21st century. Now, we've just had uh, a caller from Tasmania, Andrew Hastings, called in and wants to know about electricity wastage. He thinks that 30% of energy used is in buildings uh, and, and it's not actually being used. Is it, does he have a case there, Tony? Well, he, he does in one sense, and that Australia we have for many, many years had, well, as I said before, relatively low cost electricity. And we haven't been particularly interested in finding ways to reduce our electricity consumption because it's actually been pretty cheap. And so we've had poorly designed buildings, both houses and, mm -hmm. and, and commercial buildings. Uh, we haven't, you know, double glazing and even some parts of, the, of Europe, triple glazing, we've not tended to adopt those sorts of technology. Insulation on buildings generally been pretty pathetic. Uh, and we haven't worried about it. I mean, that's the reality is that we, consumers, businesses and so forth, simply haven't taken uh, energy efficiency or any consumption, energy consumption seriously. Um, and that's one of the contributing factors that uh, has contributed to this. It also, of course, offers one of the potential contributing factors out of this mess as well. Now, Rosemary, are you seeing more consumers trying to take matters into their own hands and perhaps go off the grid, say, installing solar panels? Is that enough for, for daily usage? Um, yes, uh, what we're seeing, Fazia, through some uh, research we did into why people are thinking about solar panels and batteries, um, is that it's a direct response to rising prices. And people who can afford to do this um, see it as a response that uh, enables them to bring these costs in their household budget under control. The issue that that um, brings forward, though, of course, is that there are many people who can't afford 
uh, to make this investment themselves or are in a circumstance either renting um, private housing or commercial uh, business property, that they're not in a position to actually make those investments. Um, Does the that mean point, then that they would have to pay more for electricity if more people go off the grid? Well, this is one of the matters that uh, Rod Sims alluded to in his press club speech last week. Um, but where we have people making these sorts of investments, there's a consequence for people left on networks where the costs are spread across all the people connected to the network. Um, so in his speech, he talks about the importance of uh, rethinking uh, network assets um, and approaches to regulation. It's, it's very important work. Now, a recent survey by the uh, Climate Council found that a, ma a majority of those surveyed believe that batteries and, and solar systems would become commonplace in households within 10 years. And as Rosemary said, it probably would be those who can actually afford to be able to do this. But if this is the case, Tony, where does this then leave energy companies in, in, in say, 10 years? Well, I think... Um, things often happen more slowly or more quickly than people anticipate. So we'll see how that develops. Um, like any major disruption to any industry, the big players are the ones who are on the defence and the smaller, more nimble players or companies are the ones on the attack. And so you'll see a lot of things playing out. Some new ideas will work fantastically, some will fail miserably, um, and, the, and the solutions will emerge. So. You know, the extent to which um, you know, batteries and uh, solar PV will become endemic across Australia, is going, I think, is going to increase. I would question whether or not there'll be many people in urban Australia, and remember most Australians do live in urban Australia, will actually disconnect from the grid because they even use one of the main benefits at the moment is to use the grid to sell surplus electricity back when you don't need it. So a whole lot of things are going to unfold. It's going to be both exciting and somewhat scary because... For those who can, as Rosemary said, afford some of these things and participate in these new ventures, mm -hmm. it's, it's great. But for those who may be left behind, it could be a real problem. And that's why the regulatory structures, the regulatory bodies need to move far more quickly than they are to get on top of this before basically technology and, cons and other consumers' choices get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I could bring you into the, into the conversation here, are private energy companies uh, concerned that consumers are considering going off the grid? Well, I think they are, and I think this is a concern that all consumers and the regulator have as well. So, for example, we've already seen to date uh, a large uptake of rooftop solar across Australia mm. uh, with feed-in tariffs uh, uh, to when they to sell excess supply from the rooftop solar into the grid. Now, the problem you have is as you're building up uh, what we call kind of, I guess, behind, behind the meter uh, uh, sources of renewable supply here is you still need to have the rest of your grid in place in order to provide power when you know, the sun is not shining in this particular instance. And as you have an, in, an uptake of, for example, rooftop solar and wind, then it reduces the utilization of power from the rest of the grid, but you still have fixed costs on the rest of the grid. So it makes it actually more expensive for the times you do need to take your power out of the grid. And in particular, in the case of rooftop solar, it can lead to quite an inequitable outcome because uh, on the whole, most people who are building rooftop solar tend to be uh, able to afford it uh, mm -hmm. in more affluent parts of society. And as a result, the cost that that imposes on the rest of the system is then borne by people who are actually less able to afford it. And this kind of inequitable outcomes is a big factor that both our private energy companies, but also the regulator are starting to look at. And I think that's why we saw, for example, mm -hmm. in the recent Finkel review, the talk about needing to impose capacity payments or firming costs on new renewable build up on an industrial scale, but it's just a matter of time as we also start to see how the government's going to deal with this behind the meter uh, individual uh, uh, company and household uh, energy solutions. Now, it, it isn't just electricity prices that are going up, gas as well. Uh, uh, so, I want to stay with you. How much responsibility should gas exporters take uh, in terms of not having adjusted their supplies to allow for domestic demand to ensure stable prices? Well, look, there's a lot of blame to go around here. And there's been a big focus in the public debate, obviously, on the LNG export industry. And there is a, that was one factor which has lead, led to the increase in gas prices today. But the much bigger factor we have here is fundamentally 
we used to have a lot of cheap gas in Australia, and that's actually reaching the point where it's running out. And the reality is, is that what's left across the east coast of Australia is very expensive gas. Okay, here endeth this movie.